Shalom. Welcome to Light to the Nations. We're studying about the Beit HaMikdash, the Rambam's Hilchot Beit HaBechira, Laws of the Chosen House. We happen to be in the midst of the month of Iyar. This is the month called by the Tanakh in the Book of Kings, the month of Ziv. It's the month in which construction on the first temple in the, in the time of King Solomon was begun. And here we are continuing the trajectory of construction on the temple by preparing ourselves as best as possible with our knowledge for the actual building of the temple. We're here in the fifth chapter of Hilchot Beit HaBechira, and I'd like to pause now for some important review and for some new information as well at the same time regarding the Beit HaMokeid, the chamber of the hearth or of the fire we've been calling it. And of course, if you recall, we began Whereas in Halacha Tetz, in the ninth Halacha, we began discussing the women's court, the history of the women's court and its function. And there, in Halacha Tet, we brought up the subject, the Maimonides, that is, the Rambam brought up the subject of the Beit HaMukhev, this large building covered over with a dome. And he mentions there in Halacha Tet that it was surrounded inside by stone protrusions, actually stone steps or shelves, and we learned that this, actually, these stone shelves facilitated the sleeping for the Kohanim inside the Beit HaMokeid. There in Halachatet, again, two entrances, two gates were to the Beit HaMokeid, one open to the Azara and one open to the Chel. Beit HaMokeid being so interesting in that it is a large chamber which is situated on the border between the Chol, the non-sacred part of the temple, and the Azara, kind of in the middle, on this, inside this wall, as it were. And then in Halacha Yud, we learned about the four mini-chambers within the large chamber of the Beit HaMokeid, the description of our sages that these four chambers are like, kind of like small bedrooms opening up onto a larger central hall, and here's where it gets a little bit confusing because we remember that there is a line of demarcation going sort of down the middle of the Beit HaMokeid because of the fact that half of this large chamber is in a holy area of the temple with a higher level of sanctity and half of it we're saying is in the Chol, in the non-sacred part of the temple. And of course by that all that we mean really in pure halachic terms is that the whole area, the non-sacred area of the Beit HaMokeid is non-sacred compared to the Kodesh, but it's obviously holier than, for example, outside of the temple at all. One can only go into even that part of the temple if one is pure, but compared to the sanctified courtyard, it is chulun, it is, it is profane, it is non-sacred. So we have two of these chambers wind up being in, on the side of the Azara, on the side of the holier part of the temple and two in the non-holy uh, whole part of the Beit HaMokeid. We have these Rashe Pisapin, Pisapin, these stone markers, this, this uh, dividing line which is going through the middle of the Beit HaMokeid to make a differentiation between the two parts. We began to discuss the function and exact location of each of these four mini-chambers within the Beit HaMokeid. In Halacha Yud, the Rambam tells us the southwest corner chamber is the chamber of the lambs. That would be the chamber of approved offerings where there are <clears throat> no less than six lambs at any point in time that have already been approved and that can be uh, used, designated for the daily offering because they have been found to be free from a blemish. And then in the southeast corner, we have the, again, this is still in the holier part of the Beit HaMokeh, facing the Azara, in the southern section half of the Beit HaMokeh, southeast corner, we have the chamber of the showbread makers, which is actually the particular family, if you recall, Beit Garmo, who were praised by the sages for having the secrets of the, actually also criticized by the sages for not wanting to release the secret to others until they understood that it was because they wanted to protect this, that it shouldn't be used, misused by people for idolatry, the secret of how to make the perfect loaves, that they should never stay, they should never get moldy. 
this was done in the sanctified part of the Beit HaMokeh, in other words, the loaves were actually baked in the holier part. And this is also, we're going to see, a place where on Shabbat, the incoming shift of Kohanim, who took over the reins of duty for the coming week, would also partake of each man of a morsel of the lechem hapanim, of the showbread from the previous week, because it was changed on Shabbat, and new loaves were placed on the table. And then, back again to Halacha Yud, this part, right now we're just doing a review. Rambam tells us, northeast, which is already in the Chol part of the Beit HaMokeh, past the Roshay Pisafin, past the demarcation line. There, in the northeast, we have the Chamber of Seals. And the Chamber of Seals is where there was a, an official of the temple who would greet someone who is coming to him who is bringing an offering, and the offering that this individual is bringing, whatever type of offering it is, is accompanied by a pre-prescribed measure of nisachim, of libation. Let's say wine, which, or oil, which is prescribed by the Torah. And this official would give a seal, a stamp, to the worshiper, and that person, that individual would bring that seal, kind of like a, a receipt, as it were, to another official who would actually give him the uh, materials for the libation. In that very same chamber, and we are going to learn why this is so, we saw famously the depiction of the fact that the stones, altar stones that had been desecrated by the Greeks in the time of the Han Hanukkah story that were not discarded, they were actually kept, but they were hidden. This is called in Hebrew, Geniza. The same term that we would use for when a holy book or a holy Torah is, becomes desecrated or simply becomes worn out, becomes invalidated perhaps by some accident and can no longer be used, is no longer functional, is no longer kosher, that item is not simply thrown away because that is sacrilegious, it's forbidden, it's not respectful. That item has to be properly disposed of. For example, a Torah would be actually buried under certain circumstances, certain halakha guidelines. In the meantime, it has to be kept aside in a, in a way that we won't get confused as to what it is, and it will be kind of isolated, quarantined, and that is called gniza, ganuz, it should be hidden. And so, so too, just as a cloth, a parchment, that it can no longer be used, has to be in gniza, it has to be hidden away, so too these stones from the altar that had been desecrated by the idolatrous rites of the Greeks, they actually set up pagan idols in the temple and even offered pigs on the altar. So the stones were uprooted, but they were not simply discarded, they were kept on the side, as per this illustration in the Chamber of the Seals. And then, which, and this is something that we haven't stressed at all yet, this is basically what we're up to in, in the end of Halacha Yud, in the northwest corner of the Beit HaMokeh, there is an entrance in that little chamber, there is an entrance by which one would gain access through a, a um, spiral type of, our sages determine, a spiral staircase, a, descent, a descending winding staircase, it's actually called in Hebrew, uh, one would descend to the area below the Beit HaMokeh, below the chamber of the hearth, in which there was a mikvah. There was another chamber with a mikvah for immersion. This served the Kohanim for a number of reasons. First of all, there is a halacha that every Kohen who is serving in the temple every day who goes steps, foot, into the Azara, must immerse himself beforehand. And that goes to, along even if he's already pure. Even if he's already pure, he must immerse himself at the beginning of his day of duty. Also, a uh, Kohen who responded to the call of nature is obligated to immerse himself afterwards. And then, too, there is a situation in which a Kohen may find himself 
involuntarily to have become to have been rendered impure. Such is the case of a Kohen who experiences a nocturnal emission at night, and then the Kohen would need to go and descend through this tunnel, this this winding staircase to the immersion chamber and immerse himself, and then he would need to actually exit the temple through a tunnel underneath from this chamber. And we're going to be discussing that um, as we continue as well. Now, in the Beit HaMokad, there is a fire going all the time. That is from that is what Beit HaMokad, the chamber of the hearth or the fire, gets its name from. And we're going to be discussing now that fire, where, where it's situated and why it's so. And also below in the lower story, underneath the Beit HaMokad, in the immersion chamber of the Beit HaTfilah, there is also another fire there, which is kept going all the time for the Kohanim to warn themselves around after they immerse themselves. There's also a lavatory in the uh, area of the chamber below of the immersion, and that lavatory has a special name, and we're going to be discussing that as well. So in Halakha Yud Aleph, which is essentially what we're up to, we have there a description of the, um, the concept of the uh, immersion chamber underneath the Beit HaMokad. Halacha Yud Aleph reads as follows, Hayored lebeit hatfila milishka zu. From this northwest corner, the northwestern chamber, which again is situated in the Chol, in the non-sacred area of the Beit HaMokad, from that chamber there was access through a stairway, Hayored, one who would descend to the immersion chamber from this chamber, Hayaholech bamsiba Haholechet Tachet Hamikdash Kulo would continue going in a tunnel which traverses underneath the temple itself. Vahanerot Dolkot Mikan Umikan Ad Shemagia Lebet Hatfila. And this stairway was illuminated by candles that were burning on both sides of the stairway, reaching the chamber of immersion itself, Umadura Haitasham, there was a fire burning there, Ubeit HaKisei Shel Kavod, and there was a chair of dignity. Vezehu Kvodo, and this is its dignity, Matso Naul, Biadua Shiyesh Sham Adam. What is its, its dignity? If one would find it, a Kohen that is, who descends to there, would find it closed, that door closed, then he would know that it is occupied. So the bathroom that was utilized by the Kohanim in this immersion chamber is called the seat of dignity, the chair of dignity. We're going to be talking more about some of the details of this immersion chamber, what it was used for, how it was used, under what circumstances, eventually, perhaps soon. But in the meantime, I would like to stop at this point and Look a little further, look a little deeper into the concept of the Beit HaMokad. The halachot here that we have learned together in chapter 5, meaning from Tet, Tet, Yud, 9, 10, now we've begun 11, they're rather sparse, as is the uh, habit of our master Maimonides, and they are quite... Um, they're quite limited as far as the information that we are receiving about the Beit HaMokad. There are other sources in the writings of our sages that are compiled both based on Mishnayot and Mesechet Midot and other places where our sages kind of fill in some of the details regarding Beit HaMokad. And I'd like to go over some more details behind the scenes of these three halachot for several reasons. One is because the Beit HaMokad is an important structure. It's actually, when you think about it, the second largest single self-contained structure in the temple complex. That is to say, after the Heichal itself, after the sanctuary itself, the Beit HaMokad is the largest uh, structure. And the details regarding the Beit HaMokad actually are not so available. In other words, 
The Beit HaMakeh described in Mishnayot Mesechet Midot, the Tractate of Attributes, which we so rely on for everything that we need to know about the Temple, the structure of the Beit HaMakeh, as presented there, is limited. We only have some details. And what is it that we really know about the Beit HaMakeh from Mishnayot Midot? We know that it's a very large structure. It's called a, a Bayat Gadol, really. And we know that it is um, expansive, and we know that it's covered over by a round roof, a domed roof, a half circle, kippah, a kippah, and that is kind of like a half circle. And again, Mishnah uh, Tamid tells us Beit Hamoked kippah, it's covered over with a dome, ubayit gadol haya, and it was a large structure. And also, of course, we know that it was built on the northern border, as it were, of the walls of the Azara, that also we see from Rashi and Masechet Yuma, and we know that it was closer to the west that we get, get again from Masechet Midot. But regarding the exact measure of its length or breadth or its heights, we actually don't have very many details in the sources. And of course, the the function of Beit Hamoked, the main function of it, is extremely important. And that is the fact that it is first and foremost serving as the dormitory facility for the Kohanim that are serving that particular shift, that particular work shift in the Holy Temple. But again, so far, what we know about it that is quite unusual is the fact that it is um, halfway between the Kodesh, which is of course the Azara, and the Chel, which is of course Chol, non-sacred proportionally, you know, compared to the Azara. And so that, actually, what's going on here, as you have seen on our map, what we have here, un unquestionably, is that the southern part of this building, the Beit HaMoked, is actually built into the Tchum HaMikudash, in the, in the area of sanctity. Kind of like a a um, protrusion, in other words, sticking into the sanctified area, sanctified territory of the Azara. And the northern part of this building is inside the non-sanctified area. So, I would like to go over some of these details. Again, the Beit HaMoked, very picturesque, very important, very multifunctional, and it's worth it for us to take our time in understanding this particular part of the temple, as we're going further and further into the temple, we have more and more detail. And of course, our goal is not just to amass the knowledge and information, but to be as knowledgeable as possible for the sake of the rebuilding of the temple and our understanding of exactly what this structure is all about. So again, Masechet Tamid, the source of the Rambam's understanding, the details that are told to us in the Mishnah, Sechet Tamid tells us Beit HaMoked has a kippah, a dome. That means a rounded ceiling. Thus, the inside, of course, of this dome is hollow from the inside. And this is the only structure in the entire Holy Temple that features such a roof. And what is its purpose? What is the reason why? Is this simply uh, architectural or is it simply stylistic? Uh, why is it that this structure is the only one covered with a dome? And the answer actually is quite logical. The answer that we can conclude when we recall that the Beit HaMoked, of course, gets its name from the fact that a large fire was burning there constantly, both day and night. And this fire accommodated the Kohanim who were quartered in the Beit HaMoked, in order for them to get warm. It was burning during the day to take some of the sting out of the air, and it was burning at night, of course, to keep them warm. Um, the fact is that the Kohanim of each Mishmar, of each particular watch, shift, slept in the Beit HaMoked, and this is explicit in Masechet Tamid, and it is well known that the Kohanim were exposed to cold. They suffered to some extent occasionally from, from cold. They uh, must, must, by prescription of the Torah, serve on, 
in the Beit HaMikdash without anything between their feet and the floor. They must be barefoot. And it was very important for them to be able to stay warm. So the dome and the higher roof accommodated the smoke that was rising from this fire so that it would, not, so that it would gather there and not um, be a nuisance down below. And this is essentially, I think, the main reason for the dome, that the smoke uh, would accumulate in the center of the, of the dome at its height. By the way, there are also opinions that I think are very well-founded that around this kippah, there were small openings, there were chimneys, there were skylights that also facilitated the release of the smoke that was certainly emanating from the large bonfire. Now, focus again on the Beit HaMoket itself. There are two sharim, there are two gates that connect the Beit HaMoket with the rest of the Beit HaMikdash. There is one gate in the northern wall of the Beit HaMoked, which served the purpose of going into entrance, in other words, further into the Beit HaMoked itself. And the second gate in the southern wall of the Beit HaMoked served the purpose of going from the Beit HaMoked itself from the Beit HaMoked into the larger uh, Azara itself. So this, of course, based on the expression in Masechet Midot that there are two gates for the Beit HaMoked, one open to the Chel and one open to the Azara. In other words, it's impossible to enter into, uh, to enter into from the Chel into the Azara through the Beit HaMoked without first going through these two gates. And thus, actually, the Mishnah really counts these two gates as one gate, because, because it's really considered to be like uh, one gate. Now, we learned in detail, we discussed the concept of the line of demarcation, which separated between the holy half of the sanctified half of the Beit HaMoked and the other half, again, only comparative, comparative to the Azara, it's called Chol, but of course it's still a sacred area of the temple, but for practical purposes it's called Chol. And there is actually a lot of discussion amongst the different commentaries about what this line of demarcation uh, is exactly. There are those that um, question exactly what it was constructed of, what type of material. There are those that uh, postulate that perhaps it was just some sort of uh, colored marking on the floor itself within the tile. There are those that mention that perhaps it was something in the ceiling or coming out from the wall. And to make a long story short, uh, the conclusion that uh, many of our commentaries reached, which we are portraying for you as well, is that they actually were a, were, were stone markers that were protruding from the floor itself that were <coughs> colored, of colored stone, that were unavoidable, uh, in other words, that it would be impossible for the eye not to catch. The, this, this line of demarcation was extremely important and had a great deal of ramification under certain circumstances. For example, a Kohen who was eating of a certain sanctified offering was not supposed to go into the non-sacred area while he would be eating that. So it's very important for us to realize that this, that these Rashe Pisafin that were going right through the middle of the Beit HaMoked really served a very important purpose to remind the Kohanim, and after all there is, this is a place of a tremendous amount of activity. There are Kohanim that are going back and forth all the time, and as we're going to be learning there are also times when one shift is leaving the Beit HaMoked and the next shift is coming in, as it were, taking over the reins of authority, the changing of the guards that's taking place within the Beit HaMoked. And with all of this activity and with all of this, the rush of the uh, responsibility of maintaining the order and, the, and facilitating all of the functions of the temple, 
It's important for the Kohenim all the time to be focused and fixed and to realize where they are. So this line of demarcation is very, very important. Of course, we have to see exactly in this structure, seeing as how half of it is in the sanctified area of the temple and half of it from without. So where exactly did the Kohanim sleep? And where exactly was this fire from which the Beit HaMokeh gets its name located? And what is the reason why the Kohanim slept on these stone slabs and not in beds? Some on the floor and some upper, higher, on these kind of like bunk bed type of stone protrusions coming out of the wall. And exactly what else happened in the Beit HaMokeh? One of the most lively and important focal points on a day-to-day -day basis in the Holy Temple, the Beit HaMokeh, and we're going to continue and discuss even more details of its function, its history, and what happened there, the better for us to be not only informed but prepared for the rebuilding of the Holy Temple as soon as possible, resting place of the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, the light to Israel, and the light to the nations. Light to the Nations is produced by the Temple Institute, Jerusalem, Israel. Dedications are available for upcoming Light to the Nations teachings. To make a dedication, please visit templeinstitute.org, the multimedia section, Light to the Nations, or email us at temple at temple.org.il. Your dedications help to make these productions possible.